Shift community and any others who may be joining us today through technology, uh, if we haven't met before, my name is Brad. I'm the lead pastor at the Shift Church. And I'm Neil. I'm the equipping pastor here at the Shift. Really honored you join us today. And we want to share with you just a little bit about what you can expect. Uh, today, Neil and I, we're going to be tag team teaching together. Love doing this. Neil and I have done this a lot in the past. But we've never done it through video, and so this will be a first. Uh, the second thing that you need to know is through social distancing, Neil and I, we will not appear on stage at the same time, but through the miracle of editing, it may appear that way. So there will be a time of teaching as well as we'll have a response time. We call this our so what. It's how do we practically apply the text. There will be worship response um, at the shift. This includes a time of worship through communion, song, giving, and prayer. And today what we want to do is try to figure out how to do this together and, and really include you and just be interactive. So as best you can, if you can have communion elements ready. Now listen, I don't know that everybody's got crackers and juice or something like that readily available at this moment. So get what you can. I've done communion before with grape soda and French bread. Just grab some bread, some juice, and the idea is that we will come together and we will thank the Lord for his broken body and his shed blood. And uh, we'll take communion together at the conclusion of worship, uh, and then we'll, we'll, have, we'll celebrate, we'll worship through giving as well. In addition, we want to encourage you to be actively involved in today's conversation, and there's two different ways that you can be involved in the conversation. Uh, although this message has been pre-recorded, go to Facebook, go to the link to this teaching, and comment. We would love to hear uh, your comments, your questions, any Bible verses, any prayer requests that you have. We are currently moderating this on Sunday morning uh, on Facebook. So jump in and be involved in that way. The second way that you can be involved is this. Take pictures. Take pictures of your family or your friends as you're connecting in your homes, your worshiping would you take pictures would you post these pictures to social media and would you use the hashtag the shift is now we also want you to stay continue to stay connected so at the conclusion of today's teaching uh, we'll share some ways that that we are attempting to connect with you and resource you so stick around to the end well for context as a church we've been walking through the gospel of luke since last may and the subtitle of the series has been called An Invitation to Hope. And we've seen so much hope so far. We've seen the compassion of God. We've seen the activity of God. We've seen the humility of Jesus as Jesus has taken on flesh. He's walking with mankind. He's reintroducing mankind to God. Uh, we've seen the strength of Jesus as Jesus has stood unmoved against Satan himself and his temptations. We've seen the compassion and the mercy of Jesus through his message and through his teaching. Uh, phrases like this, blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who are hungry now for you shall be fed. Blessed are you who weep for you shall laugh. We've seen the invitation of Jesus as he calls not only the disciples to come follow him to the path of hope and life, but by extension us as well. We've seen Jesus as the great physician. What's he doing? Like he's healing eyesight, uh, the deaf, the blind, the lame, the crippled. We've seen the authority of Jesus uh, over demonic forces, the spiritual world, over creation itself, and over space and time. And, and we've seen Jesus do this, empower his disciples uh, with the same authority, his authority, giving them the ability to cast out demons perform miracles, all while doing the greater good, greater message, proclaiming the kingdom of God. And then lastly, we've seen Jesus do this. We've seen Jesus feed the masses, 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, something that seemed so inadequate at the time. And I want to remind you that Jesus is still feeding the masses. Uh, now, due to our current reality, we're going to do this. We're just going to hit a pause button on the Gospel of Luke. We're going to return to it in the future. But right now, we're going to continue to look at Scripture for guidance in our current context. But one of the books in the New Testament that's going to speak loudly to us at this time, that's going to address our thoughts, it's going to address our hearts, it's going to address our fears, it's going to posture us in a position to properly respond at times like these, is the book of Philippians. And so we're just going to start walking through the book of Philippians verse by verse. You know, Philippians, it's rich in sound bites and quotes. Here are a few. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. 
Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Even as I read some of these verses, I'm imagining that they're so popular that you probably could have finished the line for me. Uh, But here's the danger, that we know these lines so well that they take a life of their own. And so removed from their context, they actually become sentimentalized. They become weak in application. You know, for example, we're going to call this series Rejoice. And I want you to look at Philippians 4.4. 4, and I already quoted it. It says this, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You know, for many within the church and also like even within our culture, this has been reduced to a motto. Uh, trying to just kind of will superficial joy in the midst of hardships. Just trying to talk myself into it. If I just repeat this mantra, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice that we can just kind of will joy and peace and contentment in life. You know what we've done is we've reduced, reduced ourselves to becoming Frank Costanza. You remember Frank Costanza? That's, that's George Costanza's dad from Seinfeld. Frank Costanza just tried to self-will peace and tranquility in his life by just repeating his motto. You remember his motto, don't you, right? Looks something like this. Serenity now! Serenity now! <laughs> serenity now! Serenity now! <laughs> serenity now! Serenity now! Serenity now! Serenity now! Serenity now! Well, the truth is that didn't work for Frank, and that doesn't work for us. And maybe that's what you have done in the past with Scripture. You thought that just simply by repeating it over and over again that you would get peace or joy, and you couldn't figure out why it didn't work. Is it possible that you truly didn't know what you were saying? Like there was no foundational biblical understanding about what you were attempting to apply to your life. And so the question then becomes like, how did that leave you? Frustrated? Uninspired? Lonely? Well, our goal through this series is that you would actually experience the opposite of that. So as we walk through the book of Philippians, verse by verse together, we're going to dig down to the foundational truths that we can actually build our lives upon and that that can transform the way that we are living today. And to get us started, Neil's going to come and Neil's going to give us some context for the book of Philippians. Well, before we get into the background and the context, what I want to do is read the first couple of verses of chapter 1 of Philippians. That's the two verses we're going to be looking at this morning. And so if you join with me with your uh, tablet, your, your uh, actual hard copy, uh, it will be Philippians 1, uh, verses 1 and 2. Let's take a look at it. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's so much that we can get into here, but before we get into really breaking down each verse, let's talk a little bit about the context, about the background. So the people in Philippi experienced the gospel because God sent, by the power of his spirit, Paul and Silas to Philippi about 10 years or so before Paul writes this letter. And Paul preaches the gospel in Philippi, and uh, a lady named Lydia, who's a purple trader, is one of the very first people to, uh, to believe in Jesus Christ and to be a part of this fledgling church plant. Um, Paul gets put in prison uh, for casting out a demon, <laughs> and he and Silas. And in the process of being in prison in Philippi, they lead uh, the Philippian jailer to, to faith in Christ Jesus uh, right there in uh, the prison. And so the church plant, the, the, the very first one in Europe that Paul would be a part of, um, happens with this lady named Lydia and this Philippian jailer. Um, no one who's really necessarily rich or powerful or important, but that's how it starts. But the gospel spreads in Philippi. But what we also have to understand is this is the, the right in the, the heart of Nero's Rome, his empire, where Christians are being persecuted. And so... For the Philippian people, what's happened is they used to be one of the most prized like um, possessions, if you will, of any empire. 
going all the way back to Philip the Great. The Philippians, because of natural resources like gold mines and because of their location, were uh, a place, were a group of people, a culture uh, that enjoyed really like the best of both worlds. And in the Roman government, uh, they were treated like full Roman citizens. They didn't have to pay taxes, all of these things. And all they had to do was exchange uh, some of their resources and that location that was a really prime location to have, you know, Roman military and to have Roman um, supplies there. They enjoyed all the protection, all the benefits, none of the taxes, okay? And so Philippians enjoyed a really comfortable, um, prosperous, and uh, pretty safe life. Well, as the gospel spreads, what happens is now becoming a Christian and and saying that you're a follower of Jesus is starting to be costly. And even for Philippian people who, who may kind of were some of the last ones to experience persecution, but they're starting to experience difficulty. They're starting to experience maybe some loss of income or uh, maybe even people being put in prison. And so as Paul is writing to them, he writes this letter from a place of love because he is, you know, one of the founders of the, this church plant. He's writing from a place of care, and he's also writing from prison himself. And he's saying, listen, because of what's happened to me, the gospel's spreading. Rejoice, be glad, be on mission. Don't worry so much about what this life looks like. It's temporal. Go and proclaim the gospel. Have faith. Be bold. Pour out your life. And trust me, as Paul says this from prison, he says, trust me, it'll be worth it. So it's so timely for us as we get in and start looking at each verse to know this, that this applies to us where we're at today and the circumstances we're in right now when we might want to despair, when we might want to lose hope, that we actually have all the hope in the world and all of the reason in the world to be bold about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's jump in and take another look at verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with overseers and deacons. Did you just catch how Paul just self-identified both himself and Timothy? Like we do know, like Paul's kind of a big deal, right? Like an apostle, an authority within the establishment of the early church. Uh, Using that authority to refute false teachers, to establish sound doctrine, to plant churches, to train and establish leaders within those churches. And by the way, like not to mention through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament. Like Paul is a big deal. But Paul doesn't call himself a big deal. And who's Timothy? Well, Timothy is Paul's protege. Uh, Paul's been mentoring him. He's been coaching him. I've been sending Timothy to actually refute false teachers in his place at times to establish sound doctrine. And so uh, by association, culture would look at Timothy and say, man, this dude's an up-and-comer, right? Uh, He's an influencer. And in my opinion, Timothy as well is kind of a big deal, but but Paul doesn't call Timothy a big deal. Paul begins the letter by calling Timothy and himself servants. More accurately, the term is slave. Now think about that for a minute. Does the term slave have positive or negative connotations? Like it's a dumb question, right? Like negative. It's not popular in our culture. And at the same time, we need to recognize it wasn't popular in the Greco-Roman culture that Paul is writing to. So out of the gate, we need to recognize that Paul is laying this very unpopular biblical foundation that's going to actually be a reoccurring theme throughout this book. It's the call to serve as Christ served and as you serve to serve with joy. And so this is just a little bit of foreshadowing. This is where we are going. This subject's going to take center stage, especially when we hit chapter 2, okay? Now, by the way, remember, these just aren't random thoughts that Paul was just kind of like writing down in his journal, okay? No, no, this is God the Spirit. He's nudging. He's prodding. Uh, it's inspiration to Paul to put pen to paper to write this down. This is God the Spirit actually leading the conversation. That means this. This is a call of all Christians to be servants. And then he addresses the audience. He says, 
all the saints, all believers in Philippi. Listen, this is important. Paul doesn't say he is writing solely to church leadership like I'm writing to the elders, I'm writing to the deacons, I'm writing to ministry leaders. He says he's writing to all the saints. This is a call to all the church. And so we're talking about the, the young, we're talking about the old, we're talking about male, we're talking about female. So, so if you're a man and you're in your 20s, this message is actually for you. If you're a woman and you're in your 70s, this message is for you. If you're a 12-year-old youth, this message is for you. Anywhere and everywhere in between and beyond, here's the truth. This message is for you. And so let's just do this. Let's stop. Let's make it real. Let's make it practical. Let's take ownership of it. In fact, I'd even want you to say this. Say this out loud. Say, this message is for me. Say it. Say it out loud. Say, this message is for me. In fact, do this. Just pause this teaching right now. Get out your phone. Videotape yourself saying, this message is for me. Post it to social media with a hashtag, the shift is now. Okay? That's all you got to say. By the way, people will say, like, what are you talking about? Awesome. Nailed it. Just open the door for a conversation of faith. All right? Listen, how gracious is God to us that he's sent a message to us? that he's protected this message to us, and it's a personal message for you and for me. And Paul is saying this, like, listen, we are called to the ministry of the gospel. We are called to serve. And by the way, we are called to rejoice in the hope that this life is not the highlight of our existence. Think about some of your greatest moments in life. Like, what were they? What were some of your accomplishments? Maybe it was in work. Uh, Maybe it was something in sports. Maybe it was a relationship. It's a highlight of your life. Maybe it's a possession. Listen, here's the truth. Uh, As great as those were, they were not the highlight of your existence. Like that new car that you worked so hard for and you finally got, not the highlight of your existence. That game-winning point that you made in sports, not the highlight of your existence. That new love, that moment you got married, whatever that is, not the highlight of your existence. Listen, you're a youth. You worked so hard. You spent day and night, and you finally, like, beat that video game. Awesome. Good job. Way to go. Not the highlight of your existence. Your social position. Not the highlight of your existence. And listen, moms and dads, that euphoria, the birth of your child, as beautiful as that was, it's not the highlight of your existence. All of those things are just a pale glimpse of what actually lies ahead for us. For those who are in Christ, adopted into the family of God through Jesus' blood and broken body. And verse 2 goes on to say this, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this was a standard greeting and and kind of salutation of the church, but I want you to think about it this way, okay? Think about grace to you. Think about that phrase, grace to you. And that's the grace of, of God that not only saved you, and we just say like time out, pause, like that was big, like How big was that? Like the the fact that God would give you growing desires for holiness, for selflessness, for servanthood. Like we, we can just tell the truth. Like those things aren't normal, are they? Like that was big, and as big as that was, that's not the end of the story, right? Uh, that the, the grace of God that sustains you, that strengthens you, that resources you, that encourages you, that leads you, that stretches you, that's growing you, that's not going to allow you to waste away. Listen, it's just the opposite of allowing you to waste away. It's to grow you. It's to strengthen you, uh, to, to cause you to grow up into spiritual maturity and in health. See, Paul's reminding the church it's this kind of grace that should constantly be on our mind. It's this kind of grace that should fill our minds. It's this kind of grace that we should think about, and it would have an effect on us at a core level. And its effect would be this, that we would be filled with joy as we think about God's grace. You know, grace is this. It's unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. Didn't earn it. 
<laughs> couldn't buy it, right? It was God's gift to you, right? And, and how much did he give you? Well, in Ephesians, it says, like, God has lavished you with grace. He's poured it out upon you. He soaked you with his grace because he, what? he thought it was wise to adopt you and to constantly apply this kind of grace to your life. And that these thoughts and these kind of feelings would actually motivate us now in, in hard times, listen, to press on, to strive, and to serve, not out of obligation, not out of fear, but out of a growing love and affection for God and a growing understanding of who I am in my gospel identity. And then as we work through the text, there's the subject of peace. Listen, as you are sustained and motivated by God's grace that saves you and that keeps you, something else actually begins to happen. You're actually able to find peace. Like peace with God through Jesus' finished work in our life. But listen, peace in times of difficulty or trouble, such as the days that we are living in today. You know, this past week, Albert Moeller, uh, he was discussing the subject of the coronavirus and our faith. And he said this, he said, we Christians should not despair, but have peace and joy. Because if this health crisis were to take our lives, then we would get to see Jesus. <laughs> Listen, this is exactly the kind of peace and joy that we are talking about. Because Jesus has given us life eternal with him. And because of that, now we can rejoice and have peace even in the midst of difficult circumstances. So what? How do we apply this? So how do we apply this? I mean, there's a couple of things here. I mean, one, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, I mean, what we just got through seeing is this, all this reason to have hope. All this reason to be um, filled with the Spirit, to be thinking through, even in a difficult situation, how like the gospel is the most important thing and the grace of God should be motivating me. Number one, of course, not to despair, but go beyond just the, the joy that you have personally. What about how, how we could use this opportunity where maybe some of us aren't working? And by the way, real quick, I know it sounds crazy to say I have joy and I rejoice when maybe you've been laid off. Can we just be honest about that? Like that's hard. But our joy, our reason to have hope is in Christ Jesus because the very best day that I can ever experience in this life will not even compare to what it will be like to be with him and maybe even in the most difficult and scary circumstance I can know this that one my sovereign father God has this in his hand he loves me he knows everything that's going on in my life and there is a very specific plan and I can trust him even though I can't trust my own feelings sometimes, I can't trust the, the circumstances around me or even what people are saying, I can trust Jesus. I can trust God. But that trust and that faith, maybe for those of us who are in Christ, for those of us who are followers, what if it motivated us, even if it was just from across the backyard fence, <laughs> to share the gospel with our neighbor or to hear their story? Maybe it's standing 10 feet away in our yard uh, looking at one another uh, with our neighbors and getting to know them a little bit better and possibly talking to them about the hope we have in Christ. For those of us that have families that are all kind of hunkered down together right now, what does it look like to read the Bible together? More, maybe more than we ever have. To pray together more than we possibly ever have. To remind each other, to gospel one another, to remind each other that our hope is in Christ Jesus, our peace is in Christ Jesus, our security is in Christ Jesus, our comfort is in Christ Jesus, and it's not in our job and our home and our abilities and the amount of toilet paper we have stockpiled. It is in Jesus, and that is our hope. That is our joy. And if that is evident within our home, and as we do maybe walk out on the sidewalk or to the park or just in the backyard, Maybe the folks around us will begin to see the hope that we have, and then they will ask the reason for it. And there's an opportunity, man, right there to tell people about Jesus. 
practical application for us at the shift is a, is a number of things. It's what we just talked about, like this is what we should do this week. For some of you, um, you're not in Christ. Like you're, you're watching this, um, don't know, maybe somebody told you about it, maybe uh, your interest has peaked. Maybe the difficulty of the times you live in has caused you to start asking questions about God. I don't, I don't know. Uh, by the way, that's not just you. It's not just happenstance. That's the power of God's spirit drawing you into a relationship with him. And that's why you watched this today. Maybe you just watched it purely as a skeptic. Let me say this. Um, it's difficult to find hope and peace in difficult times uh, when you just look at your circumstances, when you just look at um, government's uh, ability to handle things. What you start realizing is there's disappointment and there's difficulty. And like Brad said earlier, loneliness, the discouragement. Um, that's what you're going to keep finding if you look to the things of this world, to the things of this life, to people, to jobs, to money, whatever, to find peace, hope, and joy. I would ask you to do this. If you're watching this and you're not a follower of Jesus, would you do this? Would you this week maybe read the Gospel of John? Look at what Jesus says about himself. He doesn't give us an opportunity to just call him a good teacher. What he does is this. He gives us very clear statements that he is God in the flesh. And if he's God in the flesh, then we have to do something with that. So I'd, I'd love for you to be able to read that, check that out some this week. And then what you can do is you can email in and you can talk to us. Uh, Neil at Discover the Shift, Brad at Discover the Shift, Office at Discover the Shift. You can go to our Facebook page, post questions, whatever. We would love to have a conversation with you about that. And as Brad said earlier, for those of us who are a part of the church, who are in Christ, we'd love for you to be chiming in in those areas as well. But like we said earlier, um, we want to be somewhat interactive this morning. So what we like to do is at the shift typically during So What, somebody will talk about practical application and then we'll say this. We're going to worship through uh, song, praising God. We're going to worship through prayer together possibly which again is something you can share through social media, through our Facebook, Instagram, or through email. But something we like to do each and every time we gather is we like to take communion. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, and like we said earlier, it can be French bread and grape co. I, it, whatever you got around, okay? Um, what we want to do is take this opportunity to worship together by taking the elements of communion. And what they are, and, and this cup is some grape juice for us, and uh, just a little bit of bread. What we do is we celebrate the, the shed blood of Jesus through the juice and the broken body of Jesus uh, through the bread. And Jesus commanded us to do this. In the Last Supper, he commanded um, that, that we would do this to remember him. Um, so this is what we're doing. We're going to take the bread. We're going to dip it in the juice. You can do it however you'd like, but that's the way we typically do it. Um, and then we, we take and eat. I'm not going to do that at this moment because uh, I want to say a few more things, but um, that's how we honor Jesus. Uh, if you're not a follower of Jesus, this isn't available for you, and it really wouldn't be any, of any benefit. But for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, this is us communing with, with, with our Lord Jesus. This is us thanking him, and this is also an opportunity for us to commune together right now to thank the Lord for what he's done for us. So I'm going to pray over this, and then I'll, uh, I'll throw it back to Brad. Father, thank you so much for your broken body. Jesus, thank you for going to the cross for our sin, for our sake, taking the wrath of God on yourself uh, that you didn't deserve, uh, but doing it in our place so that we could be adopted children of God, so that we could have righteousness and forgiveness. Thank you so much. So that we could have grace and peace. Lord, thank you for shedding your blood, uh, for the remission of our sins, so that we could be covered, so that we could be um, considered spotless and righteous and adopted kids. Thank you for that. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for your Spirit's work in us, even today, reminding us of our great need for you, and also reminding us uh, how much we're known and loved. Thank you for that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we'll take the elements now. You know, last week we were reminded by some that our worship response felt a little incomplete. Uh, a lot of people emailed and said, hey, could we have a time of worship um, connected to this teaching? 
And we missed out on that, and so that's something that we're working on, and, and you can expect that next week. Uh, some other people said, you know, my worship response was a little incomplete because there was no opportunity to give and to worship through giving. And let me explain our heart. We're going to see this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 17, a little bit later on. Paul's going to say, you know, I didn't come to you looking for money. And he says, I did not seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. And so well, we want to create an opportunity for you to create a sacred moment of worship, to worship through giving at the shift we give joyfully, sacrificially, and regularly. And so this is what we're going to encourage you to do as best as possible to create a sacred moment to worship through giving. And there's a couple different ways that you can worship through giving. You can worship online by just simply going to discovertheshift.com. At our website, as you look at the toolbar on the right-hand side, there is a giving option. And so uh, you can go there and you can worship online through our website. You could actually even mail in any giving to our office, and that address is available on our website as well. And so let's just tell the truth again. Many of you have never done this before. It might just seem a little bit weird. Uh, that's okay. Just as best as you can create a sacred space to worship, we encourage you to do that. At the same time, I also do want to do this. I just want to recognize, like, remember, like last week, we didn't even mention this at all. And many people did jump in and get involved and expressed your worship to God uh, through giving last week. So we just want to acknowledge that and we want to say thank you for that, okay? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray again just kind of for our worship moment as we try and figure this, this whole thing out. And then we're going to come back uh, with some announcements and some ways that you can connect. Father, thank you so much for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy. Uh, God, I pray that you would teach us how to create sacred moments in our life that would be worshipful in a diversity of different ways. Uh, God, that we would grow in our understanding of you, that you would get more glory in our hearts and our lives, and that through your children, God, that you would be known. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we want to encourage you to continue to connect with us. There's a number of ways that you can connect with us every day during the week at 1215 on our Facebook page, Discover the Shift. Uh, we are doing daily devotionals. We, we want to encourage you to just continue to jump on and be a part of that. Maybe you incorporate that into your lunchtime. Uh, if not, you can go back and you can check those out in the evening. Uh, that would be wonderful. Wednesday night, I'm going to be again doing a Facebook Live at 7 p.m. It's, it's really kind of no agenda. Um, it's time for you to share Bible verses that are encouraging you, uh, share prayer requests. Uh, I probably will do another little tiny devotional, something like that. But just jump on. Uh, I apologize. Last week, I thought I was on the Shifts Facebook. I was on my personal one created some confusion. Uh, all this is through the, the Shift Facebook, okay? Uh, this week, uh, we are uh, going to be sending out a newsletter, okay? And that's coming out through email. Again, this is some things that you can expect, some ways to connect, um, some encouragement in that. If you are not on our email list, would you email office at discovertheshift.com and you will get our newsletters that comes out on Friday, okay? Um, go to our website on our Shift Kids page. There's a number of resources for you moms and dads, um, uh, tools for you to engage with your kids. There's videos, there's lessons, there's projects. Um, we're going to continue to feed you with more resources in that, okay? At the same time, we're trying to serve our community. Um, if there's areas, practical areas that you can serve, be of service, uh, let us know. Last thing I would share is this, is we're going to pray together. And we're going to utilize technology to pray together. And so coming up in a week on Tuesday night at 6.30, um, we are going to have a prayer meeting. But we're going to do it by Zoom. It's going to be a video conference call. If you want to be a part of the Zoom prayer meeting, email us. Just say, I want to be part of the prayer meeting. And we will send you a link and a password to get into that Zoom meeting. And so excited about that. Hey, love you all so much. Praying for you. Thanks for coming and sharing this time with us. Um, we will be seeing you soon. God bless. Mm -hmm.